To the cloud it goes, to the cloud. Okay, folks, it is about four minutes to the hour. We're going to kick off promptly at one and then folks can join as they, they come on in. We'll admit them. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to plop them in the chat and I will make sure that Sam sees them. And I'm sure you can't monitor them, I don't think with the slides, but I'll make sure to, to flag you if um, any questions come in or we can take them all at the end, whatever your preference is. Um, so, oops, admitting people. I think there were 30, 30 some people that were um, planning on joining this one. This was a more popular one, so. Yeah, there's actually, as of this morning, uh, 50. Wow. So. Um, We're all in a crowd, all right. Yeah, this was actually, I, I think the largest list. This actually, all of the SCADAs were the top three. Um, and then Metasploit. Maybe mm -hmm. folks are not as familiar with Metasploit, but Metasploit is uh, a hot number of folks. I think we have the, um... Uh, the Grass Marlin Network Discovery one, as well as uh, protocols, Modbus protocols. Um, I think that Modbus this afternoon, Grass Marlin, I think is tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think Grass Marlin is tomorrow. I think uh, our team's kind of excited to present those. That's good. It's going to be good. Okay. All right, team, we'll just give it a few more moments before we kick off. You got any good jokes, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few jokes. Um, not sure. Uh, get to know your audience pretty well. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so agree. Hey, yeah, Veronica. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, so I just retested those links. So it looks like they're automatically sending out the uh, Zoom links now. Good. Oh, good. That got, okay. all, that got all fixed. Got it. Okay. Oh, here's a couple more people coming in. And Sam, I'm just going to keep admitting people as they come in. So, Fire I think I just got everybody in. Okay, I've got one o'clock on the dot. So why don't we go ahead and kick off for <clears throat> report SCADA 101. Um, Sam is going to be our trainer today. I'll let you do your introduction and go ahead and kick off. Sure. Um, so um, a quick background about myself. Um, I started out in the Air Force. Um, ironically, I was, I was doing some, some flying for the Air Force. Ended up doing cyber in one way or another, ended up at Fort Meade, um, rotated through a program they call it CNODP. And um, through a happenstance of different events, we, we ended up prosecuting different um, technologies for them. And it ended up getting involved in ICS SCADA systems um, pretty quickly thereafter. And uh, we've been, I say we, I, I own a company called Percival, which specializes in ICS SCADA. So, um, what I, what I have for you today is kind of a, an overview of what is SCADA, because you hear a lot of terms about, you know, um, I, IOT and OT and IT and all these different phrases and terminology. So the, the point of today is to kind of get everybody on the same playing field. I know we have a, a wide range of people, some techno leads from companies in our industry mixed all the way into uh, students who are still in school. So there, there's a huge spectrum here to cover. Um, I'd like to, you know, um, well, one, I'd like to talk, so this, this should be fun, um, try to make it engaging, so if you have questions or you want to hear some details or, or anything, please, um, you know, raise your hand, I am, I have the chat window up here, I do plan to look at it while I'm, while I'm talking, so um, if you do have any questions or whatnot, please, please fire away, 
Um, and uh, also for those of you, if you're not speaking, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, there's nothing a little more uh, distracting than somebody taking a phone call off to the side. So, um, all right. So um, with that, uh, if anybody no one has any questions, then I will go ahead and get started. Right. Can everyone see those slides? We can see them, Sam. All right. Perfect. So, um, so again, uh, when you're dealing with SCADA, um, so the, the scope of this is like really, really background of just um, what is SCADA, what does it mean, where do we go? So, um, you know, when you, when you think about the, the, the stereotypical example people give for SCADA is the Homer Simpson sitting at his control station. So, and the idea being is that he's got all these different controls that operate something in the real world. So whether it's a valve, a pump, a, a switch, a relay, a door, or whatever, but there's some sort of real world system um, that these computers and these controls manipulate. And, and if there's any one sentence that you took away from this whole thing, that is that. That is what SCADA is. Um, and there's all kinds of different caveats and sub compartments and whatnot into it. But when you're dealing with uh, SCADA, supervisor control and data acquisition, um, it's projecting control. Um, it's projecting, um, when they say supervisory, it's looking at a particular system, like a real world system, exercising control and then getting some sort of feedback out of it. That's that data acquisition portion of it. So um, fitting right into right into that, um, it, it is any system that you use to monitor. Um, so like remotely, if you had a system that told you is the front door open or closed, um, that would be a very rudimentary SCADA system. Now, if you had the ability to lock the front door remotely, um, that would provide the control. So the monitor and control, not all SCADA systems provide both. Um, oftentimes they do, um, but you know, the, the real thing that separates um, SCADA from IT, IT is all about passing data around for data sake. So like emails and websites and whatnot, they don't really interact with the real world. There's no um, door, there's no light control. Um, you're not adjusting your thermostat, you know, from your IT system. They're all intended to transfer information. Whereas the, the SCADA side, you start getting into real world systems. So a couple sub compartments, um, you have OT. So typically when you're dealing with um, uh, communication systems, computers and, and whatnot, um, they're either IT or they're OT. IT is your information technology. That's the thing that's just passing around um, emails, websites, YouTube, um, you know, uh, Netflix, that kind of stuff would be IT. OT is when you start to get into something that is of an industrial or a control or relates to equipment. And there tends to be a lot of, of emphasis when you hear SCADA, it's almost synonymous with this um, OT and ICS side of the house where there's some industrial control system. Because typically when people think SCADA, they're thinking factories, power plants, um, those sorts of things. But the reality is, is your smart thermostat that's in probably every one of our houses is a rudimentary SCADA system. Um, even your dumb thermostat that you just set the little dial on, it gets a feedback and does something. It, it provides some sort of control in monitoring over a real world system. Did I, did I hear a question? No? Okay. Um, so the, the distributed side of the house, um, that is where if you, if you take this, this, um, the SCADA and you project it to another location or you project it over a wider range of spaces. So, uh, imagine you, you're at your, your college campus, somewhere in that, in that college campus, somebody is in charge of the heating and the cooling, um, right? So they have the ability to log in perhaps to your, your main hall or your cafeteria or your, your, your math, you know, math building and adjust the temperatures up and down. So they have a distributed control where they're able to go from one central location and project that control into it. So that would be a distributed control system. But all of these things, that they're kind of sub-compartments. If you look at a Venn diagram, there's a whole lot of overlap between OT, ICS, and DCS. 
Um, but SCADA as a general, when people say SCADA, all of these things are encompassed up underneath. Does that make uh, sense? Anybody have any questions on that? It, and these lines are, they're a little vague. I mean, if you had a system that no kidding emailed you your temperature every five minutes, and if you could email back somewhere and say, set the temperature up, that's a SCADA system. Like it's, it's a little rudimentary, but it's a SCADA system, right? So this, the fine lines between what is IT and OT, they really are starting to blend as technology matures. It used to be where we would have a dedicated system that controlled all of these things. And now we have Nest cams and Nest thermostats and all these smart devices that are, in, that are kind of being dropped into our environment. And all of these things sort of blend that line about what is OT and SCADA and, and IT. So as we become more and more advanced, you start to see a, more, a heavier proliferation of these IoT systems throughout um, th these lines will sort of start to get readjusted and reblended. All right. Um, so typically, though, when we're talking about SCADA and people get all excited about SCADA, what they're really talking about is critical infrastructure. So in most cases, if you start looking at SCADA vulnerabilities, they're, they're like, well, can you shut the water down? Can I turn off electric power? Electric power probably being the number one thing that you'll hear people talking about from a, a SCADA perspective. Because um, the reality is that's like the scariest thing. So, um, for example, right now down in Louisiana, there's a hurricane that just came through, and Louisiana is almost completely without power. Um, so their SCADA system um, is down there trying to control that. It detected faults and failures in an electric system, opened up breakers, shut down power, and is protecting, um, basically protecting people and equipment um, from catastrophic failure. So that SCADA system, the electric power side of a SCADA system, um, you know, most people, when you think about, well, the electric power system, that grid is designed to make sure that we get power to our house and make sure we keep our bills up and running. That, that is actually not true. That SCADA system is designed for the safe delivery of power. And so when water starts flowing over and transmission lines are getting blown over, they detect those faults and no one wants to be around a 200 thousand volt wires. So as soon as it detects a fault, it shuts the power down. And so when you're listening to Louisiana and what's going on down there right now due to that hurricane that just came through, it is a perfect example of how you had a distributed control system. You had the electric power system that was looking at all the substations and all the transformers, and they were detecting faults and failures throughout that system. There's a ground fault, meaning the wire is now touching the ground, or there's a water level that's too high and is threatening the safety, and there's a flood risk. So power starts shutting down, circuit breakers start opening up and saving those things. Those are perfect examples of critical infrastructure, distributed control, and SCADA systems all nestle up together. Um, that said, um, last week I was taking a tour of, um, I was down in Kentucky. I went down there with my family, we made a nice drive. And um, being, being the kind of nerd I am, as I was taking to, we went on a Kentucky bourbon trail, and as we visit all these different distilleries, I'm taking pictures of their um, SCADA systems because, well, I'm, I'm a nerd. I like that stuff. So I have a picture of Bullets, um, Bullet Distilleries, their SCADA system. They were kind of clever. They put it behind this glass that sort of kind of made it hard to focus. So you really can't pull out a lot of, a lot of details, but you can see the pictures as they float through. Um, went over to Lux Row. Theirs was actually ran, uh, or Castle and Key, theirs was ran from a, an iPad. I kid you not. They had an iPad that controls their whole system. Um, the, the bullet one was massive. It was multiple screens, multiple people. Um, Old Jefferson kind of had somewhere in the middle. But regardless, when you're dealing with like SCADA systems, it doesn't just have to be this critical infrastructure. In that case, they are controlling steam, they're controlling coolers, they're controlling valves, they're controlling pumps, they're controlling heaters. So all the time it takes for things to go through their still and to stay there and to get treated and to come out with that nice, nice product that I so enjoy. Like all of those things we're going through with the SCADA system. So they have a repeatable, safe, and cost-effective process so that all of that stuff was being monitored. And it does it in an automated fashion. That's that part of SCADA that really, really needs to, to settle in is it does this on a pseudo-automated fashion. We have to program the system. So we you program your thermostat to keep the temperature at a certain level. And, and when they install it, they, they say, well, this wire actually goes over to the heater and this wire goes over to the air conditioner. This wire controls the fan between low and high. And this is the input that tells you the temperature. All of those things get programmed during the provisioning and commissioning portions. But once it's up and running, you adjust a little dial to make it, you know, 
72 degrees or whatever your, your favorite temperature is, and if it thinks that it's too hot, turn the air conditioner on. If it thinks it's too cold, it turns the heater on. And all of that stuff is automatically adjusted and kept within those parameters based on its programming. The same thing applies at all of these different industries. When you're dealing with chemicals, so we're going through and we're making you know, sulfuric acid or we're making some sort of cleaning solution or whatever chemical process it is, we want to do it in a way that's safe, uh, reliable, consistent, and in most cases, cost effective is a big thing. We don't want to put any extra additives. We don't want that in the system being scrubbed and filtered any longer than it needs to be. It just needs to come out to meet the requirements of that product. So chemicals, commercial facilities. So imagine the Campbell's soup, right? It's not exactly critical infrastructure, but it's a great example of SCADA systems. Like the soup has to come out the same every single time. That tomato soup, the, the condensed tomato soup that we all know and enjoy from our Thanksgivings in the past, like that is a consistent product that is made in a facility that has automated systems that control how long they heat, how long they pump, how they, do, how they treat and make those, that, that soup. Um, communications, same sort of thing. So the Verizon, our AT&T, all of our cellular systems, these all have remote view into them. They, they require certain power. They require certain uplinks and downlinks. All of those things are being controlled remotely and maintained. Critical manufacturing, defense industry. You can see the list here. I mean, they're, all of these things are critical to the successful operation of, our, our, of how we live. So everything from water to wastewater treatment. Like all of those things are important. Uh, water actually is, is ironically not only just for drinking, but also for cooling. There's a lot of use for um, municipal water for cooling critical infrastructure. Um, so if the water goes out um, and, and there's a facility like a power plant uses water to cool itself, if the municipal water goes out, the power plant has to shut down. Um, so th there's all kinds of inter intertwined dependencies between all of these. Is that making sense? Anybody have any questions? All right. So speaking of interdependencies, um, if I were to draw up a map and try to connect all of these various critical pieces, they're all over the place. Electrical uh, Electricity is used to produce natural gas, which is used to make electricity. A little, little, little self-serving there. Same thing with petroleum. Well, you're wasting water. They're like they typically use electricity. However, water is used for cooling power plants and cool and cooling towers. You lose water, you lose electricity. So they're all sort of nestled together. Banking and finance. There's a lot about shipping and making sure that people get their money. Transportation is the same sort of thing. We need to find fuel for the, the boats and the trains and the, and the cars. Um, and then the IT and the communication side of the house. There's there's communication all over the place in here. So. All of these are these critical pillars that if you were to look at a like a, a nation or a region and say, well, you know, what happens if we lost natural gas? We'll be really bad, right? And so, well, how do we do that? How do we prevent that? Well, we have all these automated systems that are detecting the, the pressure on the pipes, the pressure on the systems. Um, you know, we, we saw that, that um, what is it, the capital pipeline that had a ransomware attack and they shut down um, the southeast uh, pump, the pipeline, right? And the ramification we saw there, there was, there was runs on gasoline, there was chaos in the streets, like systems were shutting down. And that was really out of a, th a fear for losing that critical infrastructure, right? But really what it was is they lost the, the, the ransomware attack was on the IT side of that house. But the concern was is they did not know if they got into the SCADA side of the house. And because there was so much fuel and pressure and there was a possibility for some real dramatic damage to the environment, to facilities and equipment, they were proactive and they shut down that pipeline because they didn't know the extent of the limits of the ransomware attack. It appears though, and there's still research still going on, but it appears as though that ransomware attack was only on the IT side of the house, not into the SCADA, so the pipeline itself was safe, but you know, you really don't want to risk it when you're dealing with those sort of systems. So you know, there, there's, there's this interdependency across the whole board, right? So, um, so if you, if you start talking about the history of SCADA, like where all this stuff came from, um, if you're a history buff and you start looking at like old power plants, or if you ever get to tour like an old facility, it's, it's almost scary. Um, like how, how manual things were and, and how, 
know, a system would be ran and you would know you would need a, a pressure would be overflowing if there was a red light that went off. Not an LED, but literally a red light bulb, right? So a light bulb burnout, right? So and it's it's really interesting to look into the history of where things walk, where they were back in the 50s and where they kind of are now. So when they started out, they were all about critical infrastructure. And it was mostly utilities because these were the places where there was lots and lots of money and there was a potential for lots of damage if things weren't done correctly. So oil, gas, electricity, all these sort of things needed to come online and be maintained. So somehow we had to have a control center that manages, you know, a three mile island where there, were, I think there were three reactors up there. Well, you know, there's one control center that controls all three reactors. All of that came into the SCADA system. Then we start dealing with, you know, we want to push out more control and we want to be able to manipulate and we want to be able to see more. So there's this telemetry that starts coming in. It was all serial based communications. Right. And in the 70s, that's when we start to get PLCs and, and programmable logic controllers or PLC. And, and, and they start becoming more and more prolific. So when you, when you think about a PLC, um, it's, it's a good example. So imagine your imagine your thermostat in your house. The only way to maintain and manage that thermostat in your house is if you went onto your laptop and you would check a system and you were like, well, is the, the, you have to bring up an application on your computer. And that would monitor the temperatures and it would turn the, the heat on and off and the cooling on and off in your house. Well, a PLC would be the thermostat. It's a logical a piece of equipment that you program and then you install into a system, you give it the parameters, and you just say, you manage this, right? So that programmable logic controller sits in that process um, and manages it on, on its own initiative. It does not require human interaction. So this is useful for your wastewater treatment. You need to keep the water level a certain line. There's not a guy sitting around with a keyboard just waiting to click a button as soon as that water level gets a little low to turn the pump on. Now the system is programmed so that it knows when the water starts to get a little low, put more water in. When the water gets too high, pump some water out. Same thing with power plants and electricity. If there's a high demand for power, right? You need to start ramping up your natural gas reactors or your power plants. If we start to get too much power, we start bringing these peaker speaker plants offline and bring them online. So all those things are adjusted. They're done in an automatic fashion. So that's where PLCs start to come into the picture. Did, did that explain like what a PLC is? That Anybody have any questions on that? It's a quiet group, I love it. Must be right after lunch. All right, so uh, SCADA today. Um, so back in the day, there were these giant computers the size of your, um, your suitcase. Right, and that we're maintaining these sort of systems. Now we're starting to see them getting smaller and smaller and smaller. A lot of the SCADA systems we, we, we work with today are about the size of your, your, your palm. Some of them are as small as maybe your wallet. Um, some of them get a little bit larger, but either way, they're, they're getting smaller, they're getting more automated, they're getting um, more capable of doing their own thing. So um, here's a couple of pictures we have of modern SCADA systems. So you see a Heineken plant that's right up there. That's, that's kind of interesting. That one on the bottom left, that is actually, I took that picture last week. That is the Bullet Power Plant, our Bullet uh, Distillery. So you can see the multiple displays in there, and, and those are our, our stills. And there's valves, and there's pumps, and there's heaters, and there's steam. And all of those things are being controlled right there in that control room. Um, but as, as we see more and more of this, we're starting to see a more centralized location. Interesting thing when I was there, which really kind of brings home what's going on, um, the that control station, this bullet power plant produces 1.8 million gallons of, of bullet a year. There are 16 people on crew, and they they produce this 24/7. So 16 people control the entire operation. That includes the people who are rolling the, the barrels around, right? The people who are working the grain to bring the grain into the silo. So the only way they can go through and do that with that small of a crew is it's largely automated. Like that one person right there, it's the only person in that control room, clicks all the little valves and pumps and, and buttons to control the system. And largely they're just there monitoring the system, making sure there's no issues. Um, and in a perfect case, it just does its own thing. So the only way you can get to that point is if they were able to go through and automate more and more of this. And that's where SCADA really comes into the So, so oh, you mean SCADA. Um, so when you're dealing with SCADA, there, there's all kinds of different pieces that kind of come into SCADA. 
So from the supervisory side of the house, that's where you start to get more into what you would consider like your PCs and your programmers. Um, there's the communication that rides in between it. Um, often, depending on the industry, um, there, there will be um, fiber optics. You'll, you'll see more fiber optics in SCADA um, but, uh, than, than in the IT side of the house. And that's largely because of the noise. So if you're in a factory floor, an electric power plant or whatnot, there's motors, and there's all kinds of stuff that's going on that creates electrical noise. Um, well, those aren't really great for communications, really not great for wireless systems. So fiber optics used a lot. Um, in, in the, for instance, when I was at Dins or in the, uh, the distilleries, um, they used a lot of fiber optics and then their controls to turn pumps on and off are actually pneumatic. So instead of electrifying a pump to open and close it, well, electricity can make sparks, Alcohol over 100% is flammable. There's rooms where it's considered a explosion proof room because there's flammable gases in there. Um, all those valves and pumps, they're all driven on, on pneumatics, so literally air. Um, so it, it's kind of, as you deal with different industries, you start to deal with different things. When you're dealing with like vaccines and production and whatnot, um, you know, there, there's this, this sterilization that has to occur. And so all these different environments have different requirements to um, for their SCADA systems. You have local control, so this is where the PLCs would fit in. You might have an HMI, this human machine inter interface. So this is, would be, um, imagine you go into like a, uh, you're on a ship and something's controlling the steering on a ship. Well, they're all done by wire now. There is no, uh, unless you're you're visiting the, Bol the port of Baltimore and you get on that old uh, ship, the, uh, I forget the name of that boat, but the the old sailboat with the giant wheel up front that literally has the chain that goes down to the rudder. Um, every other modern ship is done uh, by wire. So when, when, a, when you're dealing with uh, you know, cruise ships, destroyers, or, or anything in between, um, the person turns the wheel, really what they're doing is, is that wheel um, turn, that is interpreted as a signal saying adjust to the, the port, starboard, whatever. Um, well, that will send a message to the Constellation. Thank you. That will send a message down to the PLC and to the programmer. The PLC will say, oh, I need to adjust the trim this direction. That'll mean I need to put some pressure on that rudder so the rudder then adjusts. But they're all done in, a, in a, an electronic uh, controlled system. So this fly-by-wire or steer-by-wire approach, all of these are SCADA systems. So when we're, you know, in some of our previous work, we've done SCADA assessments of, of ships. When you're dealing with those, it's the same thing. There's a bus, there's these networks, there's PLCs, there's programmers. And back in the control rooms, there will be HMIs that kind of give you where are we for our, um, what's our trim currently looking at, right? All of those are there. So if you, if you start from the bottom of this picture and work your way up, what you have are these sensors. So um, let's, let's imagine that we're, I'll do the simple one, a thermostat, right? So you got a temperature sensor out there, maybe a humidity sensor, and it's in your house. Right? And it's saying, okay, this, this room is, is getting a little hot. Um, it's time to turn the, temp, the, the uh, air conditioner on. So that sensor out there doesn't say turn the air conditioner on. The sensor is just reporting back a temperature, right? So that temperature makes its way back over the PLC. And the PLC goes, okay, 72, 72, 73. All right, we're getting a little close, 73, 73 74. Oh, we're over the limit. Turn the air conditioner on, right? And so the air conditioner cuts on. So, okay, well, your air conditioner, um, you guys may not know, but air conditioners have multiple stages. Right? Well, some do. So, um, you know, it turns on the low stage of its air conditioner. It's, okay, are we trend, trending back down or do we need to turn on the high stage, right? Um, so, in the high stage is when it really pumps out that, that cold air. Um, it's a really hot day like we've been having here in Baltimore. Um, you know, that's when that second stage might get. But that's PLC is doing all of that. Now, it reports back if you were to log into, you know, I don't know, let's see, you have a Nest game. You log into your Nest profile or you have an app on your phone. Um, well, that app on the phone, that is the supervisory portion of it. So that phone goes over um, you know, GPRS or Internet or Wi-Fi or whatnot to get its information. The databases, in this case, are actually up in the cloud, right? But that PLC is that thermostat that's sitting in the middle. That it's a special purpose thermostat or PLC that just does thermostat work for that situation. Um, so that would be one example. Um, over here on the right is where you start to see motor controllers. Um, so again, let's go back to that distillery. Here we are in the distillery and I'm over at the Castle and Key where the guy has a Wi-Fi enabled laptop. No, or, I'm sorry, iPad. No, he has an iPad. The guy's got an iPad. He's floating around with his iPad. And he goes, I think that thing's been boiling enough. Click the button. Let's move it to the next tank. 
I'm not kidding you. Like that, that's what he does. Right? It's not exactly super automated yet. It's a brand new distillery. Really cool to look at. Um, but what it, what it does is you have this PLC and you have these RTUs, remote terminal units that are out connected to all these sensors um, throughout the facility. Um, this facility was around the 1870s when it was built. Really, really old equipment, old pumps they still use, old heaters that they still use. But instead of having to go through back in the day and, and turn the valves, turn, they've all automated it all. There's now controls over those pumps, now controls over um, the furnace that, that heats the steam and makes all that happen. So all of those controls now connect up to this RTU. The RTU then pushes it over to a PLC. The RTU's job is to talk to a whole bunch of different devices. Basically, you would put one in, in like a uh, in a control in a room full of full of equipment. Instead of wiring up every single piece of equipment all the way back up to the PLC, you'd wire them all up to that RTU, and then that RTU kind of acts as a data concentrator, if you will. So everything reports to the RTU, then the RTU reports up, right? And then it goes over to in, in their case, they had a local server. That local server was adjusting this and would figure out all the, the, um, the readings and the values, that would go over Wi-Fi over to his iPad where the guy was clicking on the button saying pump from this back to the next one. So um, any questions on this sort of hierarchy? So you're going to get some, uh, some lessons, uh, I believe, later today and tomorrow on uh, Modbus um, and some other, some other equipment. That Modbus is really rides around where that local control and field devices are. So it's a protocol, it's a means of which a PLC or an RTU would communicate with these um, either uh, sensors or some sort of actuator or motor control pump, whatever it is that this SCADA system is attached to. All right. Um, so getting into the HMI, well, none of this stuff is really useful if you can't put a human in front of it. So the, the HMI, um, again, you think about like uh, it can be as, as crazy as those multiple screens that we saw at the distillery or the Homer Simpson sort of display. It can be as simple as a Nest app on your, your, um, your Android device. It could be that iPad. Um, the HMI can be all kinds of different factors. Oftentimes in these industries, there's going to be one that's next to the equipment. So there'll be like a small little eight inch screen that kind of gives you like the guy who is no kidding in the field working on this equipment. You can, you can walk over and, and, and that lady could look at that screen and say, hey, look, this is the current temperature or power or whatever the state of the system. They don't have to go all the way back to the main control. But back in the main controls where you have all those screens and the operator over there, she can go through and she can look at all the different pieces and and get that wide view of the whole system. So the HMI, it, it, it can be local, it can be uh, a wide range. Um, for electric power, for instance, there's something called a energy management system that manages, um, like there's one in Texas, controls all of Texas power. And there's one place you can go to, and one control center, and you can see all the power lines and all the substations and all for the entire, all the state of Texas. Like BGE likely has the same sort of thing floating around here. But when you go into a substation, that substation also has HMIs on their, their pieces of equipment. So it's a more localized view. Um, the PLCs I talked to a little bit, these are the brains of the operation. Um, a PLC, um, the key takeaway is like autonomous. So, um, you know, imagine your job, your, your job is to keep this tank uh, filled with water up to a certain line. So water comes out, you have to add some water back in. If there's too much water in, you have to like open the valve to drain a little bit, right? And that's your job. And you're sitting there and you're having to, you know, up and down this, this level and you're adjusting the whole time, right? Well, um, a PLC will do that automatically. So it knows that like, you, well, it knows. It was programmed by a human that when the water level gets too low, close this valve. When the water level gets too high, open this valve, right? And so and there might be a hundreds of different um, readings in the air. There might be pressure, there might be steam coming into it, there might be or chilled water going on. All these different things can impact that system. And so that PLC is sitting there measuring all of those and, and it has like a safe band where it needs things to be in. And then if it starts to trend out of that, it'll take corrective action to do this. And it does it autonomously. So again, a thermostat is a crude example of a PLC. Um, the one I have at my house, you don't say I'm in the cold mode or I'm in the summer or the winter. You just have the temperature, right? And it's like, hey, if it gets too hot, if it goes above 74 or whatever it is, turn the air conditioner on. And if it goes below 68, turn the heater on, right? There you go. That, that's your system. 
So that PLC is sitting in the middle and it just knows what to do based on the environment where things are going. Um, but the key thing again here is autonomous. It takes those measurements, it looks at that data, and it will take action on its own. A human is not required to be there. Um, a human can come in and override it using the HMI and the human can look at what's going on. But once everything is up and running and programmed and configured, this PLC, it, it's on, right? It's, it's the person who's just sitting there monitoring this and making sure things are fine. Um, sensors are exactly what they look like. They can come in all kinds of different things. But now we're starting to talk about how the SCADA system actually connects with the real world. So a PLC, your, your thermostat at your house is worthless if it can't measure temperature. Um, that that uh, the tank example I'm giving you about water keeping to a certain level, like it's worthless if it can't measure water level, right? Voltage, temperature, whatever it is that the SCADA system is trying to maintain, it has to have sensors that come in. Um, these sensors come in, they can either be digital, they can be analog. There, there's a couple variations here and there, step things and like that. But generally speaking, they come in um, these two different formats. It's either digital, meaning it is or is not. So like, in that water level, there's a overflow sensor on a lot of the tanks. And so when the water hits a certain point, it's going to trip that, that overflow sensor. And that's a digital one-off. It's like, am I overflowed or not? Right? Your air conditioner actually has one of these in its pan. So there's this condensate that comes off your air conditioner. And if the water, it's supposed to drain that comes out of your house. But if for whatever reason it gets clogged up, it'll pull. And when it pulls in there, there should be a float sensor that says, Oh no, the, the drain is clogged, turn the air conditioner off. If not, well then your house floods, right? And you'll see like a water stain in people's houses from older air conditioners because they don't have this overflow sensor. That's a, that's a good example of, of an, a digital um, water level sensor. Now your analog one would be one of that's looking at that tank and saying, well, how many gallons? What's the weight or, or however it does this measurement? Like how many gallons is in this tank? And it, it knows that, you know, there's a 10 gallon tank. And so when I'm at 10.1, I'm overflowing. So the analog knows that, but that digital sensor sits on top and goes, oh, I'm at 10, you run out of overflow. Does that kind of make sense about the digital and analog? There are some variations in here. Um, you know, the analog can run any range of values. It's meant to like give you a, a, a representation of the current state, whereas the digital is, is like, is it, is it on or off? Is it overflowing? Is it not? Is there power going or is it not? Um, okay. So like your temperature at your house, um, while, while it is a digital reading, it is an actual an analog sensor that reads the temperature, right? It's an analog signal. All right, control. Um, controls are the things that, okay, now that I can tell the temperature is a certain way or the water is overflowing, this is the thing that I can do something about it. So I can turn the air conditioner on and off. I can open a valve. I can turn the heater on and off. Um, I can turn electricity on and off. All of these things can be done through this control. So this is how that PLC or the SCADA system can exert some sort of influence on a real world. Um, and this, this could be a motor controller that adjusts the trim on the ship and steers you. Because again, ships steer by wire. Um, you know, but anything that provides that control, um, typically you have a sensor, a PLC, and a control, and that is a tight loop right there. The HMI you bolt on top, and that HMI gives you a good idea of how the system behaves. When we're dealing with protocols, um, the sensors and the controls, um, they don't have to use mod. They can, but sometimes they are just as simple as a resistor that gets fed into some analog input on a PLC. Like the range of complexity for these sensors and controllers varies wildly. Um, that overflow sensor is likely just a dry contact um, uh, relay. It's either on or it's off, um, right? So it, it, the, the complexity of these systems varies. All right. Before we get into cybersecurity and threats, anybody have any questions about SCADA, like what SCADA means, how it kind of works? Um, anybody? Okay. Quiet crowd. Either doing really well or nobody's there. Uh, so threats, cyber threats are everywhere. So we start hearing about like, um, uh, and, and here we're talking about cyber threats specifically since Hack the Airport. There's physical threats and all kinds of other stuff that goes into it. But we're here we're, we're talking about um, environmental threats, hurricanes, right? But right now we're talking about cybersecurity. So in the cybersecurity realm, um, you know, you have um, network security. So typically 
Um, if you're dealing with an industrial system, a ship or a power plant or whatnot, or water treatment, they shouldn't be on the internet. I'm here to tell you more often than not, they don't do a great job of air gapping and isolating these systems. Um, some maintenance tech wants to be able to log into his phone and figure out the state of the system. Like, you know, I mean, think about it. If you're in charge of the water treatment plant, um, you do want to be able to go home, right? So at some point in time, you would like that water treatment plant to be able to send you a signal saying something's wrong here, something's backed up, something's draining wrong, whatever it is. And you want to be able to like, get tipped off that you have to go to work or you have to look into a problem. Right. So that means that that water treatment plant should be air gapped and isolated so nobody can get into it. But if you need that that email sent or that text message sent, well, you just bridge that gap. Right? You just now connected those two systems. And so if there's a way for messages to come out, there's often a way for messages to go in. And so from a network security standpoint, um, often you will see uh, these so-called isolated air gap networks, not so isolated air. Um, not only that, um, you know, to, to make it even more challenging, I mean, everyone gets, you know, everyone probably is on a laptop that's no more than three years old, right? Three, four years maybe. Um, it gets old, you buy another one. Windows 11 comes out, 12, 13. You buy another laptop, it comes with new, some new feature. Um, and so you're continually buying new hardware. Your cell phone, you know, you might have a three or four year old cell phone, but most people have like the latest iPhone. They just continually upgrade. Well. Um, that's great from an IT perspective because you want the latest and greatest. From an OT or SCADA perspective, don't fix it if it ain't broke. That's the key thing you're going to get across all of this. So when that water treatment plant was installed and all this equipment was, was hooked up and they spent a ridiculous amount of money. This stuff is not cheap. That is custom tailored. All that PLC logic was custom programmed for the specific behavior of that one facility. And there's a factory acceptance test and a rollout and this provisioning process. It's very labor intensive. It's very expensive. And it's all, it's all based on trying to find all the little uh, limits and, very, and, and risks associated to that system and program it. So when they get it up and running, just don't touch it. Like, don't look at it too hard. So you'll see like old PLCs that have been around for 15, 20 years, haven't been updated. There's vulnerabilities all over. Same thing for the software, that, that display, it's old. Don't touch it, right? Just don't look at it. Um, limited security software, I've seen PLCs that if you just do a, a port scan or an Enochian will lock up the PLC. I'm not exaggerating. This electric power system that is deployed in very, very critical places, if you just do a port scan of it, which is about as basic of a, a cybersecurity assessment as you can do, it can't handle that much traffic and it will lock up and you have to go power cycle bring it back online. So very, very fragile, um, very limited software uh, security. The PLCs don't have antiviruses. They're purpose-built little computers. Think like Raspberry Pis or Arduinos, right? That's about how complex some of them are. Um, and even the PCs that are running this in the server architecture, like if it was installed 10, 15 years ago running XP and server 2003, it's probably still running server 2003 and XP. Right? Again, don't touch it if it ain't broke. So you get a lot of that. The vendors will even come by and say, don't patch these systems. We haven't tested on the latest and greatest. And you know, a, a lot of people are like very proactive about throwing in the updates that come from Windows all the time. There, there are cases where you would do an update and it fails. It just broke the system. Well, if it's critical infrastructure, you can't afford for wastewater treatment for, I'm in the uh, Howard County, you can't have uh, wastewater stop working because we need to update a system like that. That's unacceptable. Right. And so, um, you, you know, you, these things are typically out there, super, super soft targets. It was a comment like air gap systems is a myth. Um, so yeah, there is a difference between air gap enclave isolated. So when we start talking about enclave and isolated, think like VLANs, um, think like logical separation. Uh, when we talk about air gap, we are talking about no kidding. These networks don't touch. Right. And so that would be a, a case where you can't get from one side to the other. Um, there are safe ways of doing that and engineering it. It requires some duplication of effort. You might have to have uh, two sensors and two PLCs, one that actually controls the PLC. Then this other one that kind of sits off the side that just tells you about how bad things are going and kind of gives you an update. You would have this other one report out updates, but the one actually controlling the PLC you would leave alone and keep them air gap. But that's very rarely implemented. 
Um, and in fact, some of the military systems we go to, some of the the uh, the electric the electric management systems for large swaths of the U.S. and overseas, uh, they're connected up to the internet. Um, you know, they're now they're enclave, they're isolated, but they are connected up to the internet. They are on the same switch and the same router that connects up to the internet. They go through it. There might be a firewall involved. There might be a switch involved, but you can you can tunnel a path in and out through the internet. And so when you're dealing with like ransomware and, and cyber threats, they are real. Intact the airport. This is why this should be fun. Right? If if these systems were truly air gapped, this would be a very boring hack the airport event. Um, luckily that's not the case. Um, so O and M. So O and M support um, typically the people who are online maintaining this and running this system are the, the wastewater treatment guys and they're electric power guy. Um, they are not a cybersecurity expert. That's not their job. They wear hard hats every day. They come in, they maintain these systems, and they just assume that that red light is going to turn red when it needs to, and the pump's going to turn on and off when it needs to. Um, and so when there are issues with the, the SCADA system itself, they typically turn around and go call the vendor, whoever the vendor might be, Siemens, Honeywell, you know, whatever the vendor is for that site. Um, there's just very limited support of knowing what's going on from the SCADA side of that. So from attack vectors, we can think of all kinds. Um, the HMI, where people plug into it, some of these HMIs are, are not much more than um, uh, PCs that connect to a server. Um, and so you know, the old uh, um, USB thumb drive in a parking lot trick, that's a great way. Insider threat, real threats everywhere. Uh, the PLC, we're seeing when PLC vulnerabilities that are coming out. There was one that just came out with uh, um, on the QNX operating system. QNX is used in a lot of these things. Um, VX works using a lot of these things. And if you go look for vulnerabilities, you're going to find some that are 10, 15 years old. And don't think that if you find a vulnerability that's 10, 15 years old, was patched eight years ago, that it doesn't apply to some system you're on. No, no. Uh, these systems are rarely updated. They're rarely patched. It likely still applies. So keep that in mind as you're going through this. The building automation system. So building automation this is a, a, a category of SCADA that deals with like heating and cooling, uh, chillers, uh, security cameras, door locks. All the things that deals with building in and its envelope uh, would be this building automation system. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and so if you needed to take a, you know, if I want to take communication down in this area, you know, maybe I can't hack my way into Verizon's uh, communication center that's up in Baltimore somewhere. But maybe I don't have to. If I can turn the air handlers off and the coolers off to that server environment, guess what's going offline? Those servers are now going to overheat. The cooler, you know, the chillers are going to go away, and that that communication hub will fall offline. And so there are multiple avenues of attacking a system. Not only that, they're often chilled water plants. Turn off the of water. So electricity, they have battery backups, but does their air handler have battery backups? If not, turn the power off. Right? There's all kinds of different ways of impacting these systems. Backup PLC implemented in order to support upgrades as needed. Um, yes, but rarely. Rarely do they have a true hot standby between a these PLC systems. Rarely do they they look at here's suite A and suite B, and you can toggle between the two of them. Where you start to get into things like that are really, really critical stuff, like nuclear power plants, um, ships, and stuff like that. All of those sort of things are where you'll have a completely uh, redundant controls. They just can't afford not to. Um, aircraft also have that. So if you see fly-by-wire navigation, stuff like that, they're not, there won't only be an A and a B, there's actually a C. So I have a buddy of mine, he's a, um, a C-5 pilot. On his aircraft, they, he has, it's a fly-by-wire system. C-5 is the largest aircraft the uh, Air Force has. Massive, massive airframe. Um, and it's all fly-by-wire. And it's all done through SCADA systems and controls, special purpose systems. He has three different controllers in three different systems, three different uh, airspeed indicators, three different GPSs, three different everything. And the way the system works is two of them have to agree. As long as two of them agree with each other, the third will just, it shuts itself on. So in that case, it's got triple redundancy, but really it's just got single redundancy because two of the three need to work. Um, all right, so it seems like there's a need for people to uh, yes. So, I mean, you, so the, the question that came out with Danny is, uh, and thank you, Danny, for asking that, is that there's definitely a need for more IT infosec skills to be brought into this. And the challenge for a lot of this is um, cost, um, cost to bring this in. 
So it, it seems like it would be simple. We're just going to hire a pen tester and we're going to bring that pen tester over to Baltimore. We're going to put them down inside the wastewater treatment plant and they're going to automate this system. We're going to secure this and harden it up. Well, well, that only really works if that equipment that's there is relatively modern and ready to go. You get to some of these sites and it is so old and so antiquated that you really can't even patch it. It's, it's at the point now where it's kind of replaced. Um, and, we're actually starting to see some locations that are going backwards. So it's too hard to secure this digital. Um, I know of one electric power um, installation that is going from a uh, electronic based automated system back to analog, right? Because the cybersecurity threat they feel is so great um, and there's no way to truly isolate it. They're gonna take the cyber out of it. They're gonna bring it back to old analog dials and limits. And I, I kid you not, I, I know of a place that's doing that not too far from here. Um, so yes, there is definitely an increased demand for this, but this is where you start dealing with um, you know, massive costs to come out and upgrade the critical infrastructure and the, the uh, automated SCADA systems that come along with them is a large undertaking. Things like the Colonial Pipeline, Stuxnet, all of those things, um, they do highlight uh, the need, um, but you also have to consider from the business standpoint, right? So um, does BGE consider the threat large enough to necessitate the increase in cost to bring this up? Or have what did they learn from the Colonial Pipeline is that just make sure you have a good insurance and we should be okay. I, I don't know, right? So that's a business decision that needs to be applied in those situations. But regardless, there's a lot more attention. There's a lot more interest to um, have penetration testing, vulnerability assessments on, on these systems. Hence, at the airport that we're dealing with now and, and a bunch of new efforts that largely five, 10 years ago just did not exist. So that's a, that's a great question, David. Thank you. Um, so speaking of Stuxnet, a couple of different things around here. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different ways in which uh, vulnerabilities can be deployed. Some of these are extremely complicated. Like Stuxnet was, um, it, it was novel in its complexity and novel in the number of ways um, that it pieced together cybersecurity threats. There were multiple zero days. There were multiple efforts. There were multiple things in Stuxnet that was eye-opening for people. Because up until really that point, people thought, well, okay, they're going to find a vulnerable PLC, I'll patch a PLC. They're going to find a vulnerable this and then patch that. Stuxnet um, really opened some people's eyes. Um, the cost and effort that it had to take to build that capability and the complexity that was focused into it um, really, really shook some people. Because again, put yourself in that, or take, take Stuxnet and the fact that it was a nation state, but put yourself in BGE issues. Um, if somebody came to you and said, hey, you know what? You're vulnerable to a Stuxnet level of an attack. What would you do about that? There were multiple zero days. There were multiple attack avenues. It was something that required a massive amount of engineering and design from whoever pieced together that, that attack. You know, is it worth the time and money for BGE to try to get hardened um, against something like Stuxnet? Perhaps they just focus on resilience instead of hardening. You know, we'll, we'll just be able to survive in a cyber attack. Maybe I'll have a standby piece of equipment. Maybe I get a better relationship with my vendor. Maybe I put some analog stuff in there that's not susceptible to cyber, right? You know, maybe we just harden ourselves a little bit more or make ourselves more resilient to it. But these are all the sort of cases that come into it. So as you're going through this Hack the Airport event, you know, it's, it's interesting to have that penetration testing hat and you're trying to get in there and really affect the system. But it's also interesting, turn your hat around and pretend like you're the person the, the, who's trying to defend it now. And then turn that hat around and say, okay, now you're the business person who is responsible for, do I invest in a new power plant that's going to give me more power capacity or, you know, that I can sell and make more money or do I put more money into cyber and protection so that maybe I keep the power that I have on? Where's the best investment, right? Um, so, but as you go through all these various different threats that went across, um, you know, they are wide ranging in their complexity, they're wide ranging in the areas they focus on. Right. So uh, addressing cyber threats, um, you know, there is um, prevention and protection. So there, there's a lot of government um, efforts that are coming out there. There's um, things from Congress. There's a, thing, there's a bill infrastructure package that's trying to be passed now that, that's going to provide a, decent, a large amount of funding towards critical infrastructure and, and whatnot. 
Um, some of that's going to go towards hardening and cybersecurity of this. The military has multiple avenues where they have to go through and identify the SCADA systems and the, the critical infrastructure that impacts them to try to find these vulnerabilities. Um, but really, it's, you know, what's the easiest thing you can do is make sure people can't touch it. Take the attack surface and make it as small as you can, right? So but don't put it on the internet. Don't put it on the network. Don't put it anywhere it doesn't absolutely positively need to be. Um, you know, a, a viable way of having a secure monitoring over a SCADA system would be a webcam pointing at an ICE, a truly air-gapped network, truly air-gapped. Put a webcam on it, and now you can remote in and securely look at that SCADA system, right? Um, manning it, so putting a person there that can look at that and control that. The, these are different avenues that you can use, but... You know, there are efforts to try to get into a, a network security and network protection, and they all kind of build into it. Yeah, don't poke a hole in there. Right. So, um, you're right. So, um, I mean, that's a good point. So a lot of these systems were starting out as isolated enclaves. And over time, business kind of became a thing. And, you know, it's like the, the chief security officer, the chief operating officer for a utility really wants to have the ability to log in from his house and figure out what's going on. Okay, we're poking all on an air gap network. Next thing you know, there's vulnerabilities and VPNs. And, and you know, when you open up opportunities, however small that, that attack surface is, you just opened it up. All right, so um, we're getting ready to run off. So let me let me run through this a little bit more. I think I have one more slide, which is questions. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do, and there's a lot of, of um, avenues here, but from SCADA. We talked about ICS SCADA, um, distributed control systems. As a general, we kind of covered the whole breadth of what is there. Does anybody have any questions that I can address? Anybody? Okay, um, well, I, I'm going to stick around. So if anybody has any more questions, they can fire them off in the chat window. I know we have some other um, events or another trainings that are coming up soon uh, or right after this, actually. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, my contact info is out there. I'll be attending some of these other ones today. And, and anybody that's showing up to the social, I'll meet you tomorrow. Um, but I, I really want to thank you all for attending. Thank you for you know, the great questions that came along. Um, if you do have any questions you think about later or you just want to ask me off the cuff, uh, feel free to shoot a note over to me. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so as far as uh, the recording, um, so I know they're recording this. I know they plan to post this. Um, I don't know exactly where, um, but I can get that information, try to get that out to you. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you all. I'll, I'll stick around here and hang out for a little bit, and uh, we will we will be here. Hey, thanks. I uh, got a quick question for you. Sure. So um, a PLC that's uh, hooked up to the HMI, uh, if if we scan the HMI, it's not going to impact the, the PLC itself, right? Typically not. Typically your HMI is um, added on, and typically your HMI is a safe thing to uh, approach and target. Um, just be cognizant if you're on the same network, um, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, these things shouldn't be hooked up to a, a hub. They should be hooked up to a switch. But if you're spanning things and broadcasting traffic, um, like you can, you can cause issues for these PLCs. I, I'm not exaggerating when I state that you know, ARP scanning some of these devices is dangerous. Um, just hitting it with too much traffic will overwhelm the IP stack and the network stack of these systems and make them kind of vulnerable. But um, generally speaking, and I. I think this is it's it's relatively safe for you to approach an HMI and be kind of aggressive with it. Um, it should not be impacting the PLC that it, it's connected up to. And that's only assuming the PLCs are IP based. If it's the old analog, um, yep. Well, if it's the old analog ones, you're going to have a hard time uh, scanning it. So um, they they those get challenging. There are ways of going across a serial port and, and asking it to. Um, these various protocols you'll get more exposed into. There are ways you can pull it and you can do interactive requests for updates. You can kind of dump its, its sort of settings and whatnot. Um, but generally speaking, if it's a serial device, it's, it's kind of secure. It's secured on its own. It's security <laughs> through obscurity, if you will. Um, okay. Makes sense. Yep.
Cool. Thanks. Of course. Hi, Veronica. I think we just wrapped up and people are getting ready to roll off to the next one. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Awesome training. I will see you uh, at one of the next trainings. That's great. Somebody did have a question about where would the videos and recordings be available? Uh, we're going to post them to our site and we're also going to send them out to everyone that attended. So if they were on this call, they'll get a link to it. Perfect. Usually takes about a week. All right. Lovely. Awesome. Thank you all. Hey, Veronica. Yes. Hey, it's Larry Jaffe. How are you? Hey, Larry. How are you? All right. Hey, I heard you mentioning uh, links earlier on in the at the very early part of the meeting. Did uh, are there updated links to the to the various trainings that are going on? Yes, you should have now received a link if you were registered for the trainings uh, today um, for all of them that are today. If you did, uh, okay, good. I can send oh, you. I see. It must be some kind of local filtering going on there. Going on. Oh, because you guys are you using. Um, Constant contact. Constant contact links are all yes. filtered for me. Okay, I got to find the way around that. Um, what? Hey, Larry, do you just want me to email it directly to you? Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. It's Larry.Jaffe. Um, okay, Larry. Uh, com. Got it. I'm going to send it to you right now. Um, awesome. So, did you want Thanks. all of them for today? Say again. Did you want all of them for today? That would be fabulous. Yes, thank you. Perfect. And they are in your inbox, sir. Came directly from my person's email account. Awesome. There awesome. They are. Awesome. Thank, you, Thank you all. All right. Have Take a great care. day. Bye-bye. Sam, this is Yetzi. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Hey, um, is Sam still available? Sam is still there. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, so I'm just kind of nervous here, but um, as a student um, uh, that's uh, looking into the NIST um, framework, is there a specific CSF that you would recommend in regards to this background? I'm going to meet myself. So um, if you're looking into like the NIST standards and what the NIST are, are pushing out from like a policy standpoint, where they go, um, the honest answer is these things are changing relatively quickly, right? Um, there's a lot of, of push from Congress. There's a lot of push from um, Department of Energy, um, there, you know, especially after you start to see this, the capital pipeline or the colonial pipeline, I'm sorry, right? And those are changing laws and they're, they're raising awareness to things that people really would rather not be too aware of, right? And so there are things changing in that. Um, this group, um, the Women in Cybersecurity that you're dealing with, actually has a lot of information in that. I would really encourage you to stay involved and engage with them. Um, a lot of the people that are, are attending this and pushing these, these presentations together are in those communities. There are working groups that come out of them. Um, and so like, um, like Veronica, Larry, that you were just speaking with, like, you know, we're all involved in the same arena, like pushing the envelope of this ahead, trying to understand what the administration requirements are, what the regulations and laws and where they're coming from and where they're going. So, um, and a lot of it we're trying to figure out ourselves because these laws are changing, the emphasis is changing, um, and we'll see where things go. With, with this, this infrastructure package that's supposedly coming out through Congress and all the money that's gonna come into that, what is that gonna do? Because a lot of these, these limitations that were there before may not be there, right? And so, like, th there's a lot of stuff that's going on right now. It's a super exciting time to be involved in it. Um, but, you know, reading up on like the, the NIST standards and, and where they go, it'll kind of give you a decent background. But uh, I would I would encourage you to, uh, again, um, reach out to this group, uh, attend more of these sessions, uh, more of these things that are up and coming, and they will keep you plugged in. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Sorry to go over your time. Thank you for everything. No worries. Yeah, where do you go to school at? I'm at Grand Canyon University doing the uh, Information Assurance and Cybersecurity Program, Masters. Very cool. Very, very cool.